It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Woo! <laughs> Whoa! What happened? There we go. Hello, real audience. Goodbye, fake panel. <laughs> I'm discombobulated. I move stuff around this week. Hello, you guys and gals. Uh, let's see who we've got. Marion Laird, Bernie Sims, Lamar Franklin, Gloria Covington, Harper McDaniel, uh, Michael Connor, Mojo Bone, uh, MTP Studios, Weather Eye, Carl Wittersbach, Dean Turner, Lee Lewis, Lou Lewis, um, Bonzo 230. And house. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the big show. Uh, I'm trying some new lighting this week, and I'm not sure that I'm happy. So, uh, to me, I look a little bit oversaturated in the skin tone department. But I got one of those fancy new uh, ring lights. Not that they're that new, new to me. So, trying that out because the old lighting rig was very inconsistent. I want something that was very consistent. So, before I start the show, I'm going to get this done now so that Bria doesn't kick me under the table. Subscribe. Click that subscribe. Well, you guys are probably already subscribers, but you know what? If you're watching the archive, like, tonight or tomorrow or something, and you're not a subscriber, click subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything, and it makes YouTube like us. This thing is important. Click that little sucker up in the upper right-hand corner of your screen so that you get alerts when we're going live. You all know the drill on that one, right? And last but not least, if your grandparents are still with us, share it. Okay, so this week, because we have spent quite a bit of time on dramedy lately, um, especially I think it was two weeks ago, three weeks, three weeks ago, we had Steve Barden here, who I think just has a masterfully executed collection of dramedy that I only half-jokingly said to him is probably too good, but that's his nature. When, when Steve does something uh, musical, at least, I don't know about the rest of his life, but when he does something musical, he really likes to get it right. And his dramedy stuff, uh, as you heard on the show three weeks ago, was just, uh, I don't know what else to say about it other than masterful, better than it needs to be, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with trying to be wonderful. Um, his orchestrations are, you know, even on the simplest little things, just like, ah, I never would have thought of that. And uh, he did, and it just makes it that much nicer. But I don't want his, the quality of his work to intimidate everybody else into thinking that you have to be like a world-class composer to make dramedy cues. Um, best thing you can do is watch TV. Watch the Kardashians, which I think is tonight the premiere of the Kardashians. Somebody told me, because that's what we do. When the Kardashians premiere, the whole staff stays after work, and we order dinner, and we sit in the conference room watching the Kardashians. No, we do not. Um, but we do, at least we, speaking for I, sometimes do watch the show uh, because I want to hear our members' music. A lot of the music on the Kardashians is from taxi members. So without any further ado, what we're going to do today... Oh! Before I forget this one, the Road Rally is coming up. The Taxi Road Rally is November 7th through the 10th this year in beautiful Los Angeles, California. Each and every taxi member gets a free ticket to this world-class event, and you get a second free ticket to bring your spouse or bring a friend or a bandmate. Um, and I just got double confirmation today that Jonathan Kane from the band Journey is going to be our uh, Lifetime Achievement Award honoree. So we will start out the weekend with him. Uh, we are going to have listening panels where we're going to do songs for film and TV and have those um, listened to and judged and, and some feedback from music library owners and music supervisors combined on that panel. We're going to do a music library listening panel that will be a bunch of music library owners, probably a music supervisor or two on that one as well, so we can get their perspective. Um, let's see, what else? You know what? Let me pull out the schedule that I'm currently working on. Let's see, what else are we doing? 
Um, oh, Robin Frederick's gonna, you know how she's like this amazing song analyst? She's gonna show you guys how she actually analyzes the songs this year on a thing, uh, for lack of a better title at the moment, it's called How to Analyze Songs. Um, let's see, uh, ooh, we've got a music supervisor from a big soap opera uh, and a music library owner who supplies a lot of music to that soap opera. Uh, and don't blurt out the name in the chat, even if you know. Um, and they're going to do a panel how, called How Daytime Drama Chooses and Uses Music. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, yeah. Ken Calais, co-producer of Fleetwood Mac Rumors and Tusk, is going to do a thing 5.30 on Saturday evening. We are going to play selected songs from those two albums, talk about how the songs were produced, the kind of stuff you should listen for before we hit the play button, we may actually talk a little bit while the music is running to point stuff out and then a little post-song or post-play discussion. I think that's going to be fascinating. If you haven't read the book yet, Making Rumors by Ken Calais, buy it, read it before the road rally. I found it to be fascinating, but I'm of that era, as they say. Uh, let's see, what else are we going to do? Um, how to get more forwards, deals, and placements. I'm going to do that on Friday at the Road Rally. Um, I talked about that already. Oh, and then Making Money with Your Old Recordings. Going to have uh, the gentleman who I believe is by far the, the leading publisher of vintage music. It's so many placements for our members. It's just ridiculous. Um, of course, the Happy Ending Pitch Panel that we do every year at the end. Um, Writing and producing songs for advertising with the Highfields uh, and Rob Shirelli, a music business panel that's still being kind of formulated as to who's going to be on it and what we will be talking about. Uh, and on Sunday morning with Randon Purcell and Kyle Nicely, we're going to be doing creating trailer instrumentals. So an action-packed weekend, plus we typically have somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 to 90 different breakout classes. We will have music listening panels for urban music, country music, pop music, and I think singer-songwriter. Um, what else do we have? We have the mentor lunches, which we will notify you guys about. That's the only thing that we charge for, um, and that's just a pass-through. The money goes straight to the hotel. Bree is kicking me under the table. What? It's called the Eat and Greet. Oh, the Eat and Greet. We used to call it mentor lunches. Now we call it the industry Eat and Greet. There you go. I think I came up with the name and I can't remember it. Um, so that's it. Uh, I've got to tell you, we are already more than half sold out for the rally. Um, we, did you know that we actually crossed yet another milestone line today? I don't want to divulge the number, but I will tell you that the hotel is selling out quickly, faster than ever before, and registrations for the rally are coming in way faster than ever before. I haven't even sent out an email to promote the road rally. We haven't even announced in anywhere except on this show what the, that's funny, I look at the microphone like it's a person. No, it's not. Um, but I haven't even sent out an email detailing this stuff yet. And we are already more than half full. And the hotel is probably past three quarters full at this point. So, um, it's going to be awesome. I know it sounds like marketing BS when the owner of the company says it's going to be awesome. But you guys who've been to a bunch of them know every year I work to make it at least 15 or 20 percent better than the previous year. And every year people say it is. So either they are kissing my butt and lying to my face or it's actually just getting better. I'll go with the latter. So without any further ado, what we're going to do today is we are going to listen to dramedy cues that you folks sent in. Um, and you guys in the viewing audience in the chat room are going to be the A&R people. Um, don't be unkind. I'm not going to divulge the names of the composers, um, but be constructive and wait until, um, should we, you know what, let's do voting. Let's do plus one if you would forward it, minus one if you wouldn't. And I know that this is going to be kind of a, a generic general forward. Um, so let's set the bar at, is this good enough? that you can imagine that a music library, a production music library, would want to sign it, number one, and number two, would it be appropriately good for, let's say, a reality show like the Kardashians? Um, so 
plus one, and I will say, okay, cast your votes now. That's when you hit plus one. And while the music's rolling, um, don't come out with a bunch of commentary in the chat room while it's still playing because that influences other people. So let's wait until, you know, we, we finish the track and then we'll move on. And I think... I've got enough time that we can probably, most of these are about a minute and a half long. So let's see, uh, calculate out. There are 15. How much? There are 15. Right, there's 15 times uh, 90 seconds. 15 times 90 seconds equals, who? why is that? There we go, come on. Oh, it needs light, 15 times 90 equals. Okay, let's try this with my phone. A calculator likes light. It says there's 26 minutes of music. Okay, 26 minutes of music. So there you go. Um, yeah, we've got enough time to play them all the way through and comment, all that stuff. So without any further ado, let's listen to the first one. It is called Subtle Movements. Hit it. the iCarly audience. Okay, so cast your votes. Plus one if you would forward that to a library and think it's good enough that it could be used in reality television, which is all fake, just saying. Bo Pessy says, I've been with Taxi five months and got three songs forwarded already. Great start to an awesome relationship. He says that now. Wait until we don't forward something. It'll be like, hey, sucker. I keep changing colors. I'm like tomato red. <laughs> That's what I get for using the $79 webcam. Oh, Bo says six of his got returned. That's good. No death threats or poison pen letters yet. Well behaved, Bo. And Carl Wurzbach says Bo is batting 300. That's great. I like a man with a positive outlook. Okay, Bria, what's the skinny? Okay, so uh, one person said that they would forward that, and 19 people said that they would not. Okay, one person said they would forward, 19 said they would not. So start chatting it up in the chat room. I want to hear why you guys wouldn't forward that. Mojo Bone says, I felt that it lacked the emotional content I look for in a dramedy queue. Okay. Um, Harper McDaniel says, emotion doesn't seem fit for reality TV. Peter Rahill says, title misleading. Um, Harper McDaniel concurs with Mojo Bone. Ann House says, because harsh string sound composition was good. Uh, Robert L. says, dry, harsh sounds, too busy. Uh, Steve Pro says, very stiff sounding. Little Tom Hoy, a little harsh. George Aiello, a little bit harsh. Those guys must be sitting next to each other in the back row of class today. <laughs> Spitball. Uh, sounds too harsh. Three harshes in a row. 
Um, followed by sound quality, not so good, but good ideas. Sounds too computerized, weird strings, didn't hear enough drama, had more of a children's music vibe. Well mixed, but it plotted musically. Sounds were not real pizzicato orchestral. Um, and George Aiello says, shh. Uh, as the screeners say, uh, screeners might say it needs to be more compelling. Reminds me of Jeopardy TikTok Q. Hello, Taxi. I've had 21 songs forwarded. I welcome the criticism. Thanks, Gene. Okay. Anyway, um, I, I thought those were all valid points. I mean, it certainly wasn't bad. It, it's just not quite there yet, you know, and that's something Taxi's really good at or taxi screeners, actually, our A&R staff, um, really, really good at taking people who are kind of at this level and getting them up to the level where they consistently make stuff that does get forwarded and does get signed. So um, I would say to the person who did that one that, um, I don't know, maybe your other stuff is better, maybe this isn't representative of your entire body of work, but not bad, definitely on the cusp. So there you go. Next up to bat, we have Dance of the Buttermilk Biscuits. But before we play Dance of the Buttermilk Biscuits, I want to tell you a little story about when I was a Cub Scout and we went hiking in the woods, the forest of the state of Illinois. And it was a snowy, cold, moonlit night. It was actually a full moon and ice had formed on top of the snow. I was probably, I don't know, 10 years old, and I remember the crunching sound of little 10-year-old boots going through the snow for a few miles as we hiked to the log cabin that we were staying in for the night. And once we got all of our sleeping bags deployed on the bunk beds, we went outside, we built a bonfire, and somebody, could have been the, the whoever the, actually it was Boy Scouts, not Cub Scouts. I think I might have moved on to Boy Scouts, so maybe I was 11 or 12. Anyway, somebody brought Bisquick. And what you do is you take Bisquick and you mix it with water, nothing else. And then you make it into a ball about the size of a grapefruit. And then you take a piece of tin foil and rub butter all over it so it doesn't stick. And then you wrap the tin foil around this ball of dough and you throw it in the bonfire. And then when it looks like it's starting to burst at the seams a little bit, you take a stick and shove it in there and pull it out, let it cool off, and then hit it with some butter. and. Um, I've been making that ever since I was a kid. It's amazing. It's basically a giant biscuit, but it's awesome. And the Lasco family, we call them bombers. Um, if you're on a diet, don't even think about it because they're really fattening. They're definitely high carb. Um, and with all that butter, probably high fat. But just saying, this reminded me of it. Dance of the Buttermilk Biscuits. Let's have a listen. Aren't you glad you tuned in today?
All right, cast your votes, plus one if you would forward that to a library and you think it's good enough to be used in reality television. Did, did anybody ever think that they would wake up today and hear the phrase good enough to be used in reality television? Because I sure didn't, but I just said it. Um, Ron, I, I don't want to say anything yet because I got to wait for the votes to be cast, Ron, but you're, I want you to repeat your comment later. see somebody mentioning bloopers. By the way, if you've never watched Friends bloopers on YouTube, very entertaining. If you're a fan of Friends, which I am, um, the, the bloopers are about 80% hysterical. Okay, so a couple people have mentioned this. I, there were some good aspects to this, and I'm guessing that Bria is going to say the vast majority of people gave it a plus one, which means they would forward it. Um, common themes that I'm seeing uh, in the comments are that the sounds aren't quite there. And I was a little on the fence. I'm going, okay, so did this person intentionally use some sounds that didn't sound like good orchestral samples? Because, you know, it's not a law that you've actually got to use great sounding orchestral samples. Uh, but if you're going to go orchestral, your samples should be great. But not all dramedy, as we mentioned uh, during the show with Steve Barden, not all dramedy has to be orchestral, you know? I mean, you could uh, attack the pizzicato string vibe with something other than pizzicato strings um, and accomplish the same goal and maybe make it different enough that it sticks out to an editor and the editor goes, that's kind of cool. So I was on the fence about this. I was going, so did this person try that approach to come up with sounds that were different? Or were they supposed to be orchestral sounds that just weren't very good samples? Uh, without very good articulation. So I, I wasn't sure, but I see that other people picked up on that. Um, Pierre Venois, Venio, I'm sorry, Pierre, I'm going to keep butchering your name and you have my sincere apology for that. Uh, sounds are not natural, but great arrangements, or as Pierre says, but grat arrangements. I'm pretty sure he meant great there. Oh, correction, he says great. Um, sounds uh, were a little synthy, but the mood was spot on. Yes, on the fence for me, says Steve Prost. Tom Hoyson sounds a little unreal. Um, maybe it was meant to be. I'm not sure. Um, the sounds, this is an interesting take. Uh, Harper McDaniel says, the sounds made it sound reminiscent of Halloween to me. At some point while I was listening, um, who's the guy, I know Danny Elfman composes for, who's the guy that does, um, like, Tim Burton? Tim Burton. I, I could imagine this being a Tim in a term, Tim Burton production, um, although the quality of the sounds wasn't good enough to rise to that level. But the approach, the overall approach, seemed a little Tim Burton esque. Um, nice musical ideas. Kazoo sound might conflict with dialogue. Ending might limit its use. Okay, so now let's move on to the ending. Bria, can you get us up to the ending on that? this ending would take it out of contention. Literally 90% of all editors would go, I can't use this because of the ending. While it's cute and inventive, it's a little too cute and a little too inventive. I give you points for, you know, trying to break with the paradigm of everything else, having kind of a regular um, buttoned ending on it uh, or a stinger ending, but this, it, that won't work. Um, how could you, like, go from one... If something dies naturally, it has a natural decay to it, whether it's the reverb or the ring out of an instrument, um, pretty easy to use that as an end point on a scene or in a beat, a beat being a video beat, you know, like um, an idea, a moment, a thing. Um, and you want to end that with some punctuation. Da -da -ba -ba -da -boom. Bow. That's one thing. Bow. <laughs> That's a button. That's a stinger. Bow. 
not so much. So yeah, I would definitely change the ending on that. Um, <laughs> the biscuits fell off the stage, says Darren Fletcher. Very good. Uh, Ron Kajawa says, just land on the one. Uh, Ron said, composition was great. Orchestral samples don't sound orchestral. Too processed and identical. Good points all. Um, but overall, I think people liked it. So fix the ending and maybe perfect the sounds a little bit more. Maybe it needs more of, it needs to be more obvious. Yes, these were not intended to sound orchestral, or if you had intended for them to sound orchestral, more fully commit to getting the quality up. By the way, how's my lighting this week? Just saying, got the new light. Um, curious, I'm, I'm looking at myself right now and I look like I've got really high blood pressure. <laughs> oh man. I'm waiting. Everybody's supposed to say, Michael, you look fantastic in red. <laughs> nice tan, Michael. <laughs> George Aiello says, good lighting. You look tanned. Nice tan. <laughs> I'm not that tan, honestly. I, I, I spent most of the weekend here at the office working on the road rally, and I did walk out into my backyard at one point yesterday and tilted my face up at the sun and thought, this is as close to the sun as I'm going to get for the next two months. Okay, um, moving on to number three, which is called Mountain Slide. All right, cast your votes. Plus one if you would forward this to a library and think it's good enough to be used in reality television. <laughs> Dan Weber says I look like <laughs> George Hamilton. Oh no, George Hamilton, eat your heart out. minus ones coming in. Okay, so uh, the most common thing that I'm seeing people mention is it's not dramedy. Um, it, it does sound, I made a note that it sounds a little bit like um, tension, but it, it didn't have a lot of, it, it didn't move. It was just a lot of wham, beep, doop, beep, 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 beep. It, it didn't, um, although you know, a lot of cues, especially dramedy, can be fairly repetitive, they still give a sense of forward movement, like it's going somewhere. This one just laid there kind of like a lox, and um, it, it didn't have a lot of forward movement. It also didn't convey the emotion that dramedy typically does. Um, Robert L. says, vibe is too dark for dramedy, no comedy element. So dramedy is a combination, as the name implies, of drama and comedy. So, you know, sneaking around um, is probably the most common use. Um, or somebody doing something dopey and failing at it is, is another common use for dramedy. Um, and this really didn't lend itself well to that. Um, Good enough for reality, but more ghost hunters than dramedy, says Mojo Bone. Tom Hoy says sci-fi. Paul Jacques says crime drama, maybe while somebody's being murdered. 
<laughs> it was lacking pace and a bit dark, says Robbie Hancock. Um, tension drone, yes, well, it's not really a drone because it's got rhythmic stuff in it. Drones are usually pretty legato and kind of washy. Um, made me think of a John Carpenter film. There you go, Anne House. Um, sounds like it should be placed in investigative scene tension. Yeah, so I, I think we're all pretty much in agreement. Um, what was the final score on that one? It was um, three said that they would forward and 28 said that they would not. So the score, as it were, was three would forward, 28 would not. Um, again, none of these are terrible. Um, they're just not... 100% on the money, and that's why we're here learning about how to get them 100% on the money today. All right, the next one is called Getting Ready. your votes and then after you've cast your votes then we'll talk about your comments and while you're doing that what was I I was just gonna jump out of my chair and go get something I know what I'm gonna get I'll be right back Okay, so if you woke up today and you thought to yourself, am I a big fat loser? Some people think that when they wake up in the morning. I'm not saying I've ever thought that, but some people do. Okay, so here's how you can know if you're a big fat loser or not. If you don't own this book, Writing Production Music for Television or TV, as we call it in the industry by Steve Barden, um, you need to have that book. Demystifying the Cue. Boy, look at my colors changing now. Woo! Um, Demystifying the Cue by Dean Crepain, who happens to be in the chat room. Um, incredibly excellent book. Um, gotta have this. And finally, last but not least, demyst there we go. Demystifying the Genre, also by Dean Crepain. Um, these three books aren't just recommended. They are essential to your success. If you want to do... Instrumental music, uh, especially instrumental cues that would largely be used in reality television, and you don't have those three books, then you, my friend, are a loser. <laughs> I try so hard to be funny, and I fail. It's just miserable, isn't it? <laughs> All right, so the comments about that. Liked it, but doesn't uh, doesn't feel like dramedy to me. More drama than 
D-Y. Oh, the drama then drama D. Um, yeah, it, it felt pretty... Uh, yeah, I, I, at some point during the when it was playing, I thought this makes murder funny, <laughs> and, which it rarely is, you know. Um, but there was something about it that certainly there was a lot of effort put into it, and it was pretty darn good. But there was something about it that disqualified it from really being dramedy. But yet I could see it; uh, it almost kind of drifted in and out of being dramedy and being tension. Um, too much tension for dramedy, but very good, says Steve Prost. Uh, Robert L. says, those are truly excellent books. Yes, they are. Um, Pierre says he's got two out of the three books. We'll get the third one. <laughs> Henry Van says, yeah, I'm not a loser. Um, all excellent reads. Minor Key gives a tension anticipation vibe. Nice instrumentation and sounds, though. Yep. Uh, nice movement, but pretty tense. Needs more humor and mischief. Yep. Uh, dramedy is usually mischievous and comedic. Um, it's like something is going on. Something's going to happen, but it's funny. Uh, and this could have been, I mean, at some point I thought of, um, you know, somebody like Steve Martin, uh, you know, trying to murder somebody in a comedy. Um, it, it could have been used for that. Um, Funny Murder, Peter, uh, Peter Rahill says, there's a dramedy title for you, Funny Murder. Well, there you go. Feel free to use that. No charge. Um, <laughs> next week, we're going to get 100 submissions that are all going to be called Funny Murder. Uh, just changed a minor key. Would it work? Possibly. Um, although that would take the comedy right out of it, I think. Um Dramedy equals guard your cheese. And Groover's vote just came in as a minus one. So how do we do on the numbers? Um, so I had 23 said that they would forward and seven said that they would not. Okay, 23 to seven, 23 being the forward people. Um, I, I think libraries would probably take it. Although generally speaking, what motivates, if you've ever wondered, what motivates a music library to sign a piece of music? Are they looking for an amazing composer? Not really, uh, because if the composer is so good that it takes the attention of the audience away from the script, the story, and the actors, music is a little too good if there is such a thing as that. Uh, so what motivates them to sign something? Is it licensable? Is it usable? Is it something editors would hear and instantly, literally in a second or so, go, oh, there's a contender that would work well in this scene, or no, it wouldn't, and move on. They're not going to sit there and listen to 90 full seconds of a dramedy cue to determine if they can use it or not. As you saw at last year's Road Rally, um, we had a young lady who was an excellent video editor, highly acclaimed video editor, um, and had a really good vocabulary and musical knowledge to explain how she chose music, how she uses music, how she edits music, how she fades it, how she bumps up a couple of notes, you know, to accent, uh, highlight something in the script. Um, she was really, really good at this. And she bottom lined it as, you know, is it usable? And I know in a split second or so, and if I think it's usable, but I'm not 100% sure, she looks at the waveform to see if they're edit points. And before she even listens to the edit points, if she sees them, okay, it's still a contender. Then she might go listen to an edit point and go, yeah, that would work in this cut that I'm about to do. Um, and then she or any other editor might actually kind of drop the tone arm or the needle, as it were, in two or three places, um, beginning, middle, and end uh, of the cue to see if it's got the right vibe, to see how it develops, to see if there are sections that are better, like are the latter, more developed sections uh, better use, you know, would they be better in the scene than the skinnier, less produced stuff or less arranged stuff up front? Um, so all those considerations go through an editor's head literally in, they start in a split second and they've probably made the decision in under five or 10 seconds. So if you have any illusions, delusions uh, of people sitting around a room listening to your music going, wow, 
that's just amazing. That piece of music is so good. We should put it in our show. Go beat your head against a wall because you're lying to yourself. That's not how it happens, okay? All right, moving on. Uh, the next one, I love this title because I have no idea what it means, but it's a little fascinating. Lingerie Jungle. And it won't be used on next year's Victoria's Secret um, fashion show because they've canceled it. Thank God. I don't know. I found it demeaning to women and yeah, whatever. I just thought it was stupid. So I'm glad they canceled it. Lingerie Jungle. Hit it, please. <laughs> Cast your votes. Plus one, if you would forward that to a music library, expect them to sign it and get it used in reality television. And while you guys are casting your votes, I want to compliment Peter Ray Hill, whose sense of humor sometimes astonishes me. Uh, he came up with a new title for this, uh, Underwear Underscore, rather than Lingerie Jungle. Uh, well, I don't know if it's the title, but certainly um, the um, application for this piece of music. Underwear underscore. <laughs> Man, those plus ones are flying in at a rate heretofore unseen. Guess what I've had a lot of today? You betcha. Coming up on the Road Rally, November 7th through the 10th, guess what everybody gets for free when they get there? Rockstar Energy Drink. They actually send us two pallets of these bad boys so you can stay up late at night and party with your friends. I just figured out why so many people are signing up so early for the road rally this year. Because recreational marijuana is now legal here. You could not, nobody was smoking weed in the lobby of the hotel, but people were outside smoking in the smoking area, which I think was actually created for cigarettes back in the day. But it's a little sad. I'm a little embarrassed to be a, an Angelino and have people come out of the airport and see a billboard, weed delivered to your hotel room by whatever. I'm not going to give them a plug, but, you know, I mean, I've never inhaled, just saying. <laughs> Bree is laughing. Um, okay, what, what's the score? <laughs> uh, 33 said that they would forward it, and uh, 4 said that they would not. Okay, 33 would forward, 4 would not. Let's hear some commentary. <laughs> Peter Rahill says it's a Christmas thong. Very funny, Peter. I encouraged his bad behavior by complimenting his sense of humor, didn't I? Um, Tom Hoy says, walking in my winter underwear. <laughs> That's cold. Um, 
Okay, most of tonight's selections are usable, Mojo Bone says. This last was more hip-hop than dramedy pit strings. Um, don't automatically make your cue dramedy. That's true, but it did have a key element to it for dramedy, which is the sneaking around vibe was pretty strong. So you combine that with the pizzicato stuff and having an urban beat, I mean, urban dramedy is a thing. Um, as a matter of fact, our very own, um, uh, <laughs> uh, Van, <laughs> why can I not think of his name? Um, this guy, I was just, Matt a, thank you. Matt Vanderbo was at his house two weeks ago and Matt Vanderbo is one of the great progenitors of, uh, of what is called urban dramedy. Some people even give him credit for um, coming up with urban dramedy. I don't know if that's absolutely 100% true. I don't know that it's not. I just don't know. But he does it He does it really well. And uh, gotta say, Matt was a great host and we had a great time. Actually got to see a little bit of Boise. This time I've been to Boise many times, mostly the airport. Um, he showed me around, I met his daughter, met his mom, and uh, it was nice uh, being a little part of his life for a day. Um, anyway, uh, let's see, urban dramedy, hip hop bass, uh, I'm probably gonna play the safe side. Uh, Mary and Laird giving really good advice, which is Yokohama, you have to write to the listings or it won't work. Yeah, you know, it, taking existing music which may have one or two or three of the elements that they're looking for, but really not all or most or many of the elements and pitching that is problematic. It's gonna break your heart more often than not. Every now and then you may get lucky, but our members who are most successful, I would say the vast majority of them have found that writing fresh material to the listings is a better way to go. And the cool part is rather than relying on, you know, their history and stuff that's been around for a long time and might be a little, sound a little long in the tooth, a little dated, um, they're constantly creating, writing to the listing. Sometimes they miss the deadline. Sometimes they throw out a piece of their work, but they're getting better every time because they're doing it. It's like playing tennis. You know, if you practice your swing a lot, you will get better. Um, so Bernie Sim says, established a great groove quickly and the minor key added the mischief, great strings. Um, Anne House uh, is giving out great advice here. She says, Yokohama, go through the forums, which are free. Sign up for the listings, which is free at uh, taxi.com. Learn to write for the types of music the music supervisors need. And that of course is free. And um, you know, that's what it's about. And, I know it's heartbreaking. I know as creative people, as musicians, you want to believe or you want, not you want to believe, you want people to love your music because it's an extension of you. It's part of your soul. And, and you want people to listen to it and go, I love that. That's a great piece of music. Well, whether you may choose to not be part of the industry, but for the TV industry, more often than not, they don't really care if the piece of music is great. They care that it's well executed. They care that it reinforces an emotion. Um, but really what they care about most is does it work in the scene? Does it take the emotion uh, and the storyline and, and elevate that, move it forward, make it better than it would be without the music? If those things happen from your piece of music, it could literally be something as stupidly simple as one hand on a piano doing dom, dom, dom. If it were a big orchestral piece, brilliantly written, um, like I said earlier in the show, it might take away from the storyline. So it's all about emotion and does your piece of music work in the scene to enhance the emotion and help move the emotion forward and the storyline forward. If you accomplish those things, your music is usable. Paul Curteau says, kiss. Um, Paul, I love you, dude, but, oh, I know you're saying keep it simple, stupid, right? Okay, I got it. Um, Paul Curteau also says, um, when writing music for TV, you are creating moods, not hits. Well said. 
All right. Um, moving on. Next one is called Little Folks Arrive. Okay, cast your votes. Plus one if you would forward that to a music library expecting them to sign it and get it placed in some reality TV shows. Um, I saw that Kip Johnson mentioned in the chat room uh, about a minute ago, why don't they publish the video and let us write to that? And, and I know this is going to sound snide, Kip. I don't mean it to be. But they are not in the business, TV producers are not in the business of accommodating musicians to make their life easier. Uh, and more importantly, they don't have the timeline. Imagine if they finished editing a reality TV show. They've got, a, let's say they've got a week to turn it around because it's usually episodic and it's weekly. Um, so they've got a week to turn it around. So they're going to take the video, which has been edited, but doesn't have any music in it, and send it out to, I don't know, 100,000 musicians all over saying, hey, everybody, why don't you write to the scene and then submit your music and then we'll sit down with the video and watch it and see if your music works. Or we could just uh, get a music library that's got 2,000 cues in it that are all, you know, cues that are applicable um, and very usable because they've been curated by taxi, then curated by the libraries who know the shows that they're pitching to, and they build little custom catalogs of the stuff that would sound good on that show. And the editors in the moment while they're editing the show can just go, okay, so I've got a scene at the beach where the mom and dad are hiding the kids' swimmies underneath the beach blanket. And now the kid's gonna be looking for it. So I need summery, beachy sounding dramedy um, that would be applicable for that. Um, and they look in the thing and they see a title that says Beach Blanket um, Boingo. And they go, hmm, I wonder if that's beachy sounding because it's got beach in the title. And they listen to it and it sounds like beachy dramedy. And they try it against picture and they go, yep, that works. Boom, done. So the whole thing happened inside of 30 seconds versus, and remember, a typical reality show has probably 75 to 100 different music cuts in it, you know, a hundred different placements. So imagine if they had to send that video out for musicians all over the country, if not all over the world, to try and write to 75 to 100 different scenes and then curate it. Just doesn't work that way. So again, don't mean to sound condescending or side. I'm just trying to educate you because that's what we do here on Taxi TV every week. So some of the comments, oh, uh, Bria, do you have a number yet or do they still come in? Bria does? Yes. Um, 23 said they would forward, and 3 said that they would not. 23 would forward, 3 said they would not. Um, I personally thought that was really well done. I thought that the sounds were good, that um, the emotion for dramedy was good. 
I could imagine types of scenes it would be used in. I thought that the development was good as it moved along. Um, the composer, who was a gentleman, uh, was you know adding more layers of stuff, dropping it back, adding more layers, dropping it back, and then boom, nice little stinger ending on there. I'm curious to hear from the people that did not say they would forward it, or people who would not forward it, why did you feel that you wouldn't forward it? I'm really curious to see what you thought wasn't working, because maybe I missed something. We have a viewer from Spain today. Emma Weber from London. Man, I really appreciate you guys staying up so late to watch this. Um, really, really do. Dean Crepain said he thought it worked really well. I've got a cue very much like this one playing in a ton of shows. So there you go. Dean, my brother, we agree. Doesn't surprise me. Um, I felt sort of laboriously string heavy to me, or it felt sort of laboriously string heavy to me. Um, Paul Croteau, I, I always vacillate between Croteau and Croteau. I'm guessing it's Croteau. Uh, I almost said, he said, um, I thought it was too repetitive for too long, but needed some variation. I, I thought the variation came in the last, like, 20 or 30 percent of it. I'd have to go back to double check myself, but I remember that. Um, James Hooker is a virgin. You might be the only hooker that's a virgin. Um, crow, <laughs> crow toe, crow toe, crow toe. <laughs> that's how we pronounce Paulie's name, crow toe. I'm going to practice that for the next two months. So when I see you at the road rally and go, hello, Mr. Crow toe. Um, I'm trying to see if there was anybody else that didn't forward it that had a comment. Uh, there was. Give me a minute. Uh, Jeff Westman said, nice composition arrangement, uh, nice comp composition and arrangement, but too perky and chipper for dramedy. Uh, I've got to say, who was that? Jeff Westman. Jeff, you're wrong. Jeff Westman, you're wrong. Uh, he said it was too perky for dramedy. Dramedy is often perky. Um, man, oh man. Uh, hey, Dino. Um, oh, you know what? Uh, the chat room won't let you post a link. But you should go to Dean Crepane. Good luck spelling his last name, which is K-R-I-P-P-A-E-H-N-E. Find and drop a link in. Okay, Bria is going to find his site, drop a link in, so that you can go hear what good dramedy sounds like. Um, it's often perky. Right, Dean? I'm not nuts. Perky is a good word. <laughs> perky is for cartoons. Well, yeah, you know, that's kind of what dramedy, you know, sneaking around Elmer Fudd, hiding behind the tree. Yeah. Um, Marion Laird says, Bria, you're awesome. Oh, look at that. Her head is expanding. I'm looking over at her and her head is going. <laughs> Alan Gilbert says, I would forward but thought it was very busy, may fight the actors. But there were parts of it that weren't, so the editor can pick and choose what they need. Um, Steve Probe says, definitely perky. Okay. Um, Bria's going to post a link to Dean's stuff. Um, I already did. There it is. Dean Crepane. K-R-I-P-P-A-E-H-N-E dot net slash media. There you go. Dean Crepane dot net slash media. Look at that. I can read. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, next one is called High Wire Hijinks. That's a really good to uh, title, by the way. As was Little Folks Arrive.
Cast your votes, plus one if you would forward this to a library and expect it to get used in a reality show, minus one if you would not. And I'm gonna go grab another Rockstar Energy drink and uh, I will be right back. Rhea, would you like one? No, I'm good. Oh, Bria's already got one on her desk over there. Now I'm having a little tiny one just because I'm thirsty, and this one is called zero-calorie watermelon. There you go. Look, it matches my face. <laughs> ah, refreshing. Okay. Sean Smiley says, it reminds me of some quirky Kardashian pranks. There you go. Perfect. Uh, Tracy Stover says, Inspector Gadget theme. Um, Bria's totaling up the numbers. Marion Laird says, Kardashians use dramedy all the time. And just for those of you who don't know, we are based in Calabasas, California, home of the Kardashian family. And we see a lot of really goofy cars that are, have blacked out windows that I'm pretty sure have Kardashians driving them on at our gas station, literally across the street from our office complex. Um, one night I was leaving work. I was working really late, like 11 o'clock at night. Um, it was run up to the road rally, pulled into the gas station, and I saw a Fisker, which is a car you don't see very often. I believe it's an all-electric, like Ferrari-ish looking car. Um, and it was chrome from end to end. And who's sitting there pumping gas? <laughs> Which is ironic because I believe maybe it's a hybrid. I don't know. But who was there? It was Justin Bieber in his Fisker. No comment. And the numbers are? Um, 32 said that they would forward it and 4 said that they would not. 32 would forward, 4 would not. Um, some of the comments, uh, several hundred... Paul Croteau says he's had several dramedy cues placed on the Kardashians. Well, hopefully they were able to pick themselves up after being late. I'm squished by, you know. <laughs> is it on or in the Kardashians? We screw that up in listings all the time. Prepositions are not our strong suit here at Taxi. Um, Jaw drop, chrome car. Yeah, he told me that the reason he had an all chrome car was to mess up the radar of the police who were trying to nail him all the time. Uh, and I kind of remember checking out the Fisker and I think it only had like a 40 mile range or something ridiculous. You can buy a used Fisker that's in like brand new condition with really low mileage on it for like 35,000 bucks. It looks like a $200,000 car. Um, <laughs> Tom Hoyt says, wow, a brush with greatness and Justin Bieber didn't even know it. That's right, Tom. You've got your priorities straight, buddy. <laughs> Uh, Michael Mishnya says, I've got to say, the last three cues were spot on. I agree with you. Um, Fisker? No, no, I'm not even going to repeat that. I'm... <laughs> um, Michael is the water man, watermelon, the watermelon man, boop, boop. I don't understand, Jesse. Um, Mojo Bone says his opinion last cue was dead on, straight up the middle, a strike. I agree. Uh, I thought it was really good. Um, I'm curious, once again, people who didn't think that it was right on, why not? And House asked the same question. She wants to know. Inquiring minds want to know. I want to know, why the hell am I so red? Is it the red shirt? No. Okay, while the four people who wouldn't forward it are going to fess up why they wouldn't, I'm going to go adjust something on my light to see if I can change my color to a nice icy blue. I already had it 
pretty hot up on the blue spectrum. Nah, I'm just shinier now. Oh, what the hell? Who cares? It's not like it's real television. Um, Fisker out of business in 2014. Somebody else bought it, uh, and they now make the same exact car with a different name, and I can't remember who. Uh, what was the Fisker was the brand name, and the model was Loop, and whatever the Loop was is now the name of the the company. Um, have the people Paul Croto says some of the woodwinds were too synthy, too midi. Um, I've got to say, if I were a library owner and I hear a lot of these cues and I hear really, really super high-end good ones, um, or maybe even a taxi screener might pick up on that and say, yeah, I can't afford it. The problem is, and we never know exactly where to draw the line because some libraries have a little lower bar for their standard. Other libraries have a higher bar. I gotta believe that almost any editor um, working in reality TV would use that cue. And an editor on a TV show, uh, unless something is less good than what we just heard, but using that last one as the example, I, I don't think they would have a problem with the sonics of it. Sometimes you can get a cue that sounds remarkably good on so many levels. So many of the instruments sound great and you go, wow, good job. And then they'll have like a clarinet come in and the clarinet all by its lonesome, I mean, not that it's, you know, out there solo, but I'm talking about the clarinet sample sounds so bad or so poorly, um, the expression on it is bad, um, the sound quality is bad, maybe it's an old sample, who knows, whatever the reason is, it just doesn't sound as good as the rest and it will kill the cue. And it would probably kill the cue for the editor as well. Um, Justine Jones says, yeah, that MIDI bassoon, who? Play it again, listen to the sample. Uh, some libraries have no bar. You know, I've got to say, uh, every now and then we get emails from people or phone calls or comments that we see out in the public where people say, oh my goodness, uh, Taxi never forwards this piece of music and I just got it into a library. But what they don't mention is that the libraries Taxi is working for, screening for, um, almost without fail or, or you know, like higher end libraries, uh, they're not, I mean, we could work with the cheesier libraries, but we don't, we turn them away. And so sometimes people don't get through the forwarding process or screening process here at Taxi, and then they do get something into a library on their own. But then when you really research it with them, you come to find out that they're in libraries, which I won't mention the names of, that pretty much take everything. And one of those libraries, it's kind of famous for taking everything, but has kind of a cool name that starts with a P. Don't say it in the chat room, please. Um, that they just announced that they're lowering the rate paid to musicians to 35%, which, eh, you know, you kind of get what you pay for. Um, Yeah, uh, Paul Croto, Croto <laughs> says, if they take everything, that means their library has a lot of good and a lot of bad, and supervisors learn that it can be a waste of time uh, to try and find the good among the bad. Absolutely. Could not agree more, Paulie. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, next one is called Active Imagination. I think my teachers told my parents I had one of those. Thank you. 
okay, cast your votes, plus one if you would forward it to a music library and expect it to get used in reality television, minus one if you would not. Um, Nina Harris says, how long should these be ideally? I, I think 90 seconds is a good way to go. And it doesn't have to be exactly 90. It could be 89.2. It could be 94.3. Um, it could be two minutes long. You don't want to go shorter than a minute, generally speaking. Um, but 90 seconds gives you enough time to get some good sectional contrast and create a sense of forward movement and probably get a B section in there, which um, you don't have to have a B section in a queue. But editors like it. Sometimes they may want to start out with the back half of a B section and then go back to the A section. Who knows? But um, 90 seconds, I think that's a good average. Emma Weber casts a not sure. I'm sorry, Emma, we don't have a not sure button. And the numbers are? So 24 would forward and 3 would not. 24 would forward, 3 would not. So pretty good forward ratio. Um, gosh, there, I had a thought about it, and now I can't remember it. But there is definitely, can you play that one from like the middle, please? <laughs> That sounds a little eh. Cynthia part bothered me that that didn't help it it hurt it a little bit uh, in the ending just didn't feel well executed didn't feel like a typical stinger or buttoned ending it just felt like oh this is the end let's not have any more music so um, I personally would not have forwarded that one although the person who did it was very close and certainly understands the genre and is heading in the right direction I just personally didn't love that one but we all have our own opinions um, somebody said mice moonwalking or moonwalking mice Peter Rahal I thought that was funny Gloria Covington uh, commented that it felt incomplete because it was a B not a B a interesting observation um, and how said it would have been better if uh, it had some contrast come earlier, but I gave it a plus one. So yeah, it, it was pretty darn good, but could have been better, but you know, certainly on the right track. All right, moving on. Um, that one was what? Uh, Active Imagination we just played. Okay, next one is called Mischievous Deeds. Great title.
false ending. And I was fooled. All right, cast your votes, plus one, if you would forward this to a library and expect it to get used in a reality TV show. Minus one if you would not. On these, what keys are we working with? Just for FYI, please. I have no idea. Um, and I can't say that I've ever heard anybody comment on a key that works particularly well, but something to keep in mind would be um, that you want to preferably have stuff that if there are, if there's dialogue in the scene, that your music can lay behind it and still bolster the mood without getting in the way of the dialogue. So stuff, you know, like, excuse me, guitar solos or um, saxophone. Sorry, Polly, I know you're a saxophone player. Um, you know, things that, that aren't in the vocal, in the spoken word range, which is probably somewhere between, you know, a thousand, one K and up to maybe 3,500 or 4K. That's where most of the, the voice is heard. So instruments that are in a key and have a timbre that would conflict with that are probably best to avoid. D minor, it's the saddest of all keys. Always left at home when everybody else gets to go Christmas shopping. Poor D minor. And the numbers are? Uh, so six said that they would forward it, and 20 said that they would not. Okay, six forwards, 20 that would not. Um, how are we doing on time? Not enough for me to re ask for commentary. All right, we're moving on. Next one is called Off Kilter. Okay, cast your votes, plus one if you would forward it to a library and expect it to get used in reality television, minus one if you would not, and you better be willing to, as I like to say, stake your career on it. A curious mixture of numbers are flowing in. Wow. 
A lot of votes coming in. Tom Hoy clearly said something funny, and I've lost it. I can't find it. There we go. Great minds, Emma. No. Charlie Chaplin bit. Maybe that was it. Um, okay, and the numbers are? So 13 said they would forward, and 16 said they would not. Almost a tie. 13 to 16. 13 being the forward, 16 being the naysayers. Um, there were a few things, I can't remember what they are right now, but there were a few things in there that bothered me a little. But overall, the person who composed that seemed to have a good grasp of the genre and is very close to nailing it. So have hope. Um, and then Peter Rahill made the brilliant observation that with the title like Off Kilter must be an Irish victorious secret thing. <laughs> You know, uh, what was um, Hanson, uh, the gentleman from Cleveland who owns pizza shop? Scott Hanson, how would you like to be on a road trip with Scott Hanson and Peter Rahill in your car? <laughs> oh, that would be fun for about an hour. <laughs> All right, next up we have Pick It Up. Peter Ray Hill says, uh, I think it was Peter, maybe it was Paul, he said, you need a rim shot for the show. We have everything. This is a big budget show. Okay, cast your votes. Plus one if you would forward this to a music library and expect it to find its way home on a reality television show. Castanets, that would be a really good name for a band full of fishermen. Castanet. Okay, so while you're casting your votes, I'll tell you a funny little story. So I was fishing. There's a, a guide that I use in Cancun, Mexico, that does um, like backwater fishing, you know, um, small boat with like the, the guy that stands up on a little platform and pulls you around and you cast at the fish kind of stuff. So... Anyway, uh, after I'd gone out with him a couple of times, he trusted me to drive the boat while he was going to stand on the bow of the boat and use one of those circular cast nets trying to get some bait fish. <laughs> and his, his English is worse than my Spanish or equally as bad. We don't communicate all that well, although over the years we've gotten better about it anyway. 
<laughs> My microphone is drooped. I'm now um, miking the table. Uh, anyway, he uh, was standing on the bow of the boat getting ready to cast the net, and he goes, reverse, reverse, or forward, forward, whatever. I hit the opposite <laughs> the boat and sent him flying off the boat head, head first into the drink, and he got caught up in his own net. It was priceless. <laughs> so now every couple of years when I go down there and fish with them, He's like, oh, God, here's that guy again. <laughs> All right, looks like the voting is done. Bria is totaling as we speak. Okay. So 18 said that they would forward, and 9 said that they would not. 18 would forward, 9 said they would not. I got to say, I thought that was a pretty interesting cue. Could have used some little pieces of refinement. I can't remember what they are, so please don't call or email me after the show and say, so what was it? Cause I don't remember. I have to have Bria wear a sign on her forehead so I can remember her name. Uh, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm terrible with names and titles. I really am. I have been this way my entire life. Um, but overall, I, I thought it was kind of interesting, and there were some novel ideas in there that, that worked well. So keep up the good work, because that was really close, if not 100% on the money. Um, next one is called, I love this title, the next one is called Sneaky Fridge Raider. Think about it. In a reality show, there are quite a few scenes where people are, are taking stuff out of the fridge when they're supposed to be dieting, blah, blah, blah. So let's see if this lives up to the title. show's going to run a few minutes long. Uh, we're two minutes over, but you know, it's not like it's real television. So while you're casting your votes, <laughs> gosh, there's Mauricio, the guide with my daughter Gabriella holding up a fish that was promptly returned back to the water so it could live to fight another day. But Mauricio, I love you, dude. Been fishing with that guy for 10 years. He's awesome. And it's really funny to watch him go off the bow of the boat. <laughs> Oh, Mauricio. I swear he sees me coming. He's like, oh, crap, here he comes again. <laughs> Nina Harris says, I like your daughter already. Why? because we threw the fish back. We always throw the fish back. I gotta say, the older I get, the more guilty I am of scaring the crap out of the fish too. It used to be bad to kill them. Now I feel bad scaring them, but I love fishing too much to stop scaring them. <laughs> Nina says yes. I've got to see if I can find a picture for you, Nina. <laughs> This picture actually causes me tremendous guilt. <laughs> Look at the expression on this fish's face. It was thrown back into the, that fish was out of the water for less than 20 seconds. But it's like, 
uh, what was Finding Nemo? It looks like a fish in Finding Nemo going, oh my gosh, what's happening? <laughs> Poor fish. Look at my daughter's face. <laughs> anyway, we try to be, a, you know, they say a fish only has a three second memory. So at least I know that they're not going to go back in the water and get a whole school of other fish to come and attack the boat. Let's get that Lasco family. Um, and the numbers are? Um, eight said that they would forward, and 16 uh, said that they would not. Interesting. Eight would forward, 16 would not. Um, Jan Willage says, close but not quite there. Um, Joe Gothard says, grease and cornmeal. Oh, <laughs> he's talking about the fish. <laughs> Uh, ended kind of abruptly. I thought the ending was a little strange on that one. But again, it was in the ballpark, you know. I, I love these shows because it just proves that even the stuff that's not ready for the, the big time yet is still pretty darn close. Our members are getting it. And the vast majority of our members, you know, not that long ago didn't even know what a dramedy cue was. Hey, Bria, can you jump up and tighten that sucker? You're going to have to loosen it and then tighten it, I think. There you go. Thank you. I really had that thing clamped down. Um, Peter Rahill says the fish story had a good hook. I may have to go back to the old mic stand. Bria's getting a workout over there. Thank you. Um... Okay, <laughs> well, people are on the fish thing now. Uh, fish story had a good hook. Oh, carp. <laughs> good line, Peter. <laughs> uh, okay, next one's called Fun on the Twail. Oh, I get it. That's a take on trail. Fun on the Twail. <laughs> Okay, cast your votes. Plus one if you would forward that to a library for use in reality television. Minus one if you think it needs a little help. <laughs> Tom Hoy still on the fish thing says he's working for scale. <laughs> I have an interesting observation about that one, and I'm curious to see if anybody comes up with it to make me feel good about my own observation, <laughs> or if I'm all alone in the end zone on this thought.
Okay, looks like the voting has stopped. Bria is whipping out the calculator. So uh, 22 would forward that one, and 6 would not. 22 would forward, 6 would not. Paul Croto, <laughs> he's going to form a group called the Crotomatics. Piano sound halfway through was not very good at all. Performance could use some quantiz, qu yeah, whatever, quantifying. <laughs> the mix needed work, like the pithy strings were, whoops, um, heavy with reverb. Others were not. Uh, the thing that I noticed about it was that it was like a score. Uh, there were so there was so much sectional contrast and so many different ideas that if it were scored to picture, you would go, "Oh, that's a cool score." Uh, but for the usability factor by an editor, there's just too much stuff going on. My personal feelings. Um, Let's see, uh, needs touching up, love the writing. I think we all love the writing. So, you know, don't be discouraged by my comment. Just, uh, it, it was like five cues in one. Um, stylistically very good, sounded like deliberately out of tune, silent movie piano. Um, yeah, score like Steve Pro says, uh, very composed, too complex, keep it simple, stupid in quotes. Um, Need some sectional healing. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, really, how many business owners get to hang out with people like you, uh, other than people who run asylums? <laughs> oh, I love you guys. I really do. Um, okay, last one. Uh, this one is called Don't Be So Sneaky. <laughs> And thank you, Polly, for mentioning the Vibra Slap. I was sitting here trying to think, what the hell is that thing called? Because I used to have one in my studio back in the day. Uh, Bria is going to... Oh, cast your votes. She can't total what ain't been cast. <laughs> casting for fish, casting votes. <laughs> Did you fall for that hook, line, and sinker? Okay, while you guys are casting your votes... I'll see if I can find some other fish pictures. <laughs> I mean, really, seriously. Look at that little fish's face. <laughs> Poor guy. But again, he lived. He was thrown back in the water.
Okay, and the numbers are? So 22 said that they would forward, and 2 said that they would not. 22 would forward, 2 said they would not. Uh, on a scale of 9 to 1, he lived. Um, I'm curious why the 2 would not. Gloria made an, an interesting observation, which is extremely busy tambourine may interfere with the scene. You know, a great test that everybody should do with every cue that you make is turn your uh, monitors down. Once it's done and you finish the mix, the next morning, or at least give yourself some, you know, like ear refreshing time, and then turn the mix down to where it's barely audible and see what pokes through because there's a reasonably good chance, you know, your cue is likely not going to be the star of the scene. So turn it down and see what pokes through because sometimes something like a tambourine or other really high endy thing or something that's in a, a high register, um, if it's really low in the mix, it's going to be the thing that pokes through when the editor, they might like it when they choose it at normal level, then they lay it in the scene, mix it down low and go, oh, you know, all I hear is the tambourine. So I, I can't say for sure that Gloria was 100% right on this because I wasn't paying attention to it. She may be, she may not be, I don't know, but it's a great point. So thanks for bringing it up. Um, a fine line between fishing, standing on the shore, looking like an idiot, said by Stephen Wright. Uh, I always look cool when I fish, just letting you know that. Um, you guys are st <laughs> you're on the fish thing. You want to hang out for another half an hour? I'll just show you fish pictures, because I would love that personally. Anyway, um, this uh, I felt that you guys were right on the money. You know, I, I love doing these episodes because it shows me how much you've learned over time from watching Taxi TV and participating in the Taxi Forum at forums.taxi.com. Don't forget to register if you're a member. Register for your free tickets for the Road Rally, which is November 7th through the 10th here in Los Angeles, right next to beautiful LAX Airport, which never gets congested with traffic. You can get a free shuttle every 15 minutes so you don't need to rent a car. The hotel rooms are 140 bucks a night. I just compared that to the price of hotel rooms for another conference where they are $100 a night more. And the conference is infinitely more money and frankly not as good uh, i'm not kidding so that's it we will see you next week thank you all for sending in your music thank you for participating in the chat i have no idea what we're going to do for next week's show maybe it'll be an episode about fishing until then see you guys next week for another exciting episode of taxi tv live bye bye ladies and gents